Hey, hey, this is Julian, and you are on Eat the Blocks. And in this video, I'm going to explain what are the different architecture for a decentralized application. So first, let's talk of the different building blocks that we'll find in any kind of decentralized application. So of course, we'll find a smart contract on the blockchain. That's really the core of your decentralized application. All your valuable data and all your valuable data processing is done in this smart contract on the blockchain. Then beside this smart contract, we'll also find a wallet where users will store the private key that will allow us to send transaction to the smart contract and modify its data. And we also find a front-end UI that will allow users to interact with the smart contract in an easy way. So this front-end UI can be a web application or a mobile application. So the first architecture for Ethereum DApp is what I call a pure DApp. So with this architecture, everything is decentralized. So your smart contract, of course, it lives on the blockchain, is decentralized, but it's connected to a front-end that is not served from a centralized server, but instead, this is served from a decentralized file system like IPFS. So it's not possible to hack into a centralized server or restrict access to the centralized server so that the front end is not available. In this case, everything is absolutely decentralized. Um, so that's really the purest form of Ethereum DApp. There are actually very few DApp that are architected like this because uh, using uh, IPFS uh, is a little bit more complex, but ultimately in the future, at some point, most DApp will be like this. Then the second architecture is what I called common DApp. So most decentralized applications are built like this. So you have your smart contract that is connected to a web frontend, but this web frontend is not served from IPFS, but it's served from a centralized server. So most of the important components of your DAP are decentralized, smart contract is decentralized, the wallet is decentralized, but the frontend is served from a centralized place, so you have a vulnerability. The third kind of architecture is a backend plus broadcast of transaction. So in this architecture, you still have your smart contract, you have your front end, you have your back end that serve the front end. Um, but users, they don't sign transaction on the front end and send them directly to the blockchain, but instead they send their transaction to the back end. The back end is going to make sure that the transaction is correct and is going to broadcast this to the uh, Ethereum network. So why we don't have user to broadcast the transaction directly themselves? Well, it can be that we want to protect users. So for example, so they might do some, uh, some transaction that are, um, that are not correct and they, they, can, they can do some, uh, some mistake, they can, uh, they can lose money. So by passing the transaction, then we, we make sure that uh, in broadcasting it ourselves, we make sure that everything is correct but it makes the system uh, less decentralized because if the backend is compromised, then the decentralized application uh, will not work. Uh, it's still somewhat acceptable because users can always decide to, uh, to send a transaction themselves to the Ethereum network. So the backend doesn't have that much of power, but it is still a bit more, uh, more centralized than the, so the previous architecture. The next architecture is a backend plus signature. So with this architecture, clients don't directly create and send transactions from the front end to the blockchain, but instead what they will do is they will create a message that describes the change that they want to make on the smart contract and they will sign this message and they will send everything to the back end. The back end is going to make sure that everything is fine and it's going to create an Ethereum transaction. It's going to embed the signature of the front end is going to send it to, to a smart contract. The smart contract is going to do a few things. First, it's going to make sure that the transaction comes from the, the wallet of the backend. And it's going to make sure also that the signature of the end user is correct. So there is no way for the backend to, uh, to fake the user, to cheat the, the system. So this is secure. And then it's going to perform some action. So this system is very used, for example, by decentralized exchanges. So the orders, when you want to buy or sell EAS20 token for EAS20 token, you, 
you don't send your order directly to the smart contract, but in general, there is an off-chain order book. So when you create an order, you create this signature. You say, hey, I want to buy this ERC20 token, and here's my signature. So the order book is going to, uh, to, to show to the, to the front to the front end uh, all the, the different uh, order. And when there is a match, then it's going to combine the signature, create a transaction, and send it to the smart contract. So the big advantage of this architecture is that for end users, they don't have to pay for a transaction cost. All they have to do is to sign messages and, uh, and then the transaction cost is going to be buried by, it's going to be supported by the backend wallet uh, of the decentralized application. So, so that, that's really good. Um, the problem is that if the, the backend server of the DAP is uh, hacked, uh, it can absolutely empty the, the wallet of the DAP and make the DAP uh, unusable. Um, this being said, it's not possible for the hacker to forge a uh, user's signature, so uh, it still remains uh, quite safe and it's like a good compromise between uh, the decentralization and uh, need of decentralized application and also the practicality of how, uh, what we need uh, in, in production. And the last architecture is a backend plus a centralized wallet. So with this architecture, actually, there is absolutely no wallet on the front end. Uh, users will interact with the backend uh, like a normal web application, and probably that they will send some money to the backend with normal system like, like PayPal or bank account or, or credit card. And then after they've been authenticated, they'll be able to take some action on the blockchain. So the backend will create transaction on behalf of the user, but it will not use the private key uh, of, of user. It will use the private key of the of the backend. Um, and so the problem of this system is that it's actually not very decentralized. Uh, okay, there is an interaction with a smart contract, but the end user is not uh, capable of controlling that part. It's entirely delegated to uh, to the backend. So uh, if uh, you work with a company that decides to shut down your account, then, then you, you lose all your access to, to the DAP. Um, also, if this is hacked, uh, then it can be a big problem. However, there is a big advantage is that with an architecture like this, it's much easier to onboard user because they don't have to install a wallet on the front end. Uh, they don't have to uh, buy some Ether or sorry, some ERC20 token. So it's good for a beginner user of blockchain application. So among these five kinds of DAP architecture, which one have you already used and which one would you like to try and what kind of challenge you see, let me know in the comments down below. That's pretty much it on what are the different architecture for decentralized application on Ethereum. Thanks for watching. See you in another video. Bye-bye.